Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. I am happy to have Automotive Seminars as a sponsor for the show. Now, if you're not familiar, Automotive Seminars is a diagnostic technician training company. They've got a website that there'll be a link to in the show notes. And what they offer is top-notch training to technicians like us in the field. I've been taking their training courses for years and have got a ton of benefit out of it. They've got top-notch instructors, John Thornton, Scott Shotton, Scott Manna. And every other month, they've got a two-night course that you can sign up for. Join in, ask questions, and afterwards, you've paid for the course, you can access a recorded version whenever you want. You can rewatch the class two years later in case you wanted some details on it. And that is a fantastic feature. So make sure to check out the website to see what courses they have available and what's coming up in the future. Hey, what's going on, automotive world? Welcome to another episode of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Dipping. I'll be your host once again for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I got another case study here for you today, along with a helpful tip when programming modules on Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat, Stellantis, whatever you want to call it, vehicles nowadays, uh, especially when replacing multiple modules at one time. We'll get into that. Before we start, um, I do want to give a shout out to a few different people and an organization that is the Florida Auto Care Alliance. Uh, Last weekend, I was down in Orlando and I presented my first professional level full length class, right? I've done stuff to college. I've done tech talks where it's 15, 20 minutes for a presentation, but this is a full three and a half hour class and a really cool experience. I was super nervous. Um, I think I got into the swing of things after about five, 10 minutes, um, but it was really cool to get an opportunity Uh, to present and share some material with my peers that was really fun but the event was awesome too they did an excellent job of putting it on and uh, got to meet and hang out with some awesome people Uh, notable uh, we went out to dinner on Saturday night Alan and Edwin uh, they're from down in Miami and uh, it was fantastic to meet those guys they were they were a riot and really really cool guys too so uh, I like to Give a shout out to them, but it was a really great experience. So if you're in the area or you're considering training, uh, hopefully they're going to put this on next year. Um, This was the first version of this exact event uh, put on, but uh, I see some big things in the future. So definitely would recommend it uh, if you're looking for some training in the Florida area. Anyways, with that out of the way, I'll get into the case study here. Um, Again, this is interesting enough on the vehicle um, and and I'll get into why but then also I want to share something that I feel is a really helpful tip and if you're not aware of it or you haven't utilized it to to its full potential um, this is a great great resource uh, that's available within service info right read the service info maybe I could just say that would be done right (laughs) Um, and we always read every single detail of service information don't we all of us yeah okay um Anyways, uh, here's the vehicle. It's a 2016 Dodge Ram 2500 with a 6.7 liter diesel. Customer of mine actually purchased this from an auction and it was a flood vehicle. And he had called me on this, actually texted me a few times saying, hey, I got this flood truck and I need you to make me a key for it. And when I bought it from the auction, it didn't come with any keys. And he did mention it was a flood truck. And I'm like, all right, I can make a key for it, but if this was a flood truck, and of course, depending on how high the water got up in this thing, you're going to need a lot more than a key. He's like, yeah, I kind of figured, but I figured I would get a key program to it and then kind of sort out what I needed from there so I could at least turn the ignition on. I'm like, dude, you're probably not going to be able to turn the ignition on. Um, I went to a Honda CRV uh, earlier this summer 
that was the same situation. They just, and they didn't inform me correctly on the phone. They just said, hey, can you come make a key for this Honda CRV that this customer bought from the auction? And I get there on this thing. And of course, completely dead. And you jump the battery and it's still completely dead. And I'm looking in this thing and there's that little area in the instrument cluster where the actual gauges are. And then there's a like plastic film, right? There are casing over the cluster that like houses the cluster. And there was sand <laughs> inside that area. And I went and talked to him. I'm like, um, I think this is going to need more than a key guys. And that was a flood vehicle too. It was like, and the customer ended up not being interested in sorting through all of the like everything uh, i mean the water was up to the instrument cluster this thing was completely underwater so start with everything and we'll go from there right so kind of the similar situation in the dodge he's like well how do i know what to replace okay well that's you know you bought the vehicle you kind of have to figure that out but i'm like you should figure out how high the water went in this thing because that's going to determine what components were failed and sounded like this has got all the way up to the dashboard based on uh, you can see remnants of it in the metal of the vehicle, right? It'll start to rust the, those interior metal components very quickly because they're not protected by anything. And that it was clear that the water was pretty high up on this thing. And so he's like, okay, well, I'll start to sort through stuff, see what I can find. He's like, what important modules should I be looking for as far as you getting a key working for this thing? And I'm like, well, you got the body control module, for sure, um, that's going to be exposed based on what you're telling me. I was like, you need to check out the RF hub on this, which is behind the rear seat. And the keyless ignition node in the dash as well, although that's not a module per se, right? There's no programming. It does relay the key data to the RF hub, so that's going to have to work. And then I told him too, I'm like, hey, just understand before you get into this, a flood car, especially one that's really deep underwater is going to need way more than you think it needs off of the initial inspection, right? And maybe we get this thing to a point where it keys up and you're going to find 20 more things that need to be fixed. You're going to find connectors all over the place that are corroded, all kinds of issues. And I just was telling them this to let them know, like, Hey, I don't know how much you paid for this thing, but it might not be worth sinking the money into because it's going to be an endless avalanche of different problem after different problem when it comes to the electrical components in the car but hey you can lead a horse to water right and i told him what i was going to tell him i'm not going to diagnose the thing for him over the phone i gave him the helpful information that i could and i don't hear back from him for about three months actually the original conversation happened a while ago well, just recently, I get a call from him. I'm like, hey, remember that Dodge? Yeah, okay. Well, I think I got everything sorted out. I replaced the BCM. I replaced the keyless ignition node. I replaced the RF hub. I replaced a bunch of connectors and wires and fuses. And All right. And this guy's pretty competent. Um, like, obviously, I don't know <laughs> the decision-making process that went into purchasing this, purchasing this vehicle and taking on this project. But when it comes to the repair and getting vehicles back to a working state, he's done a pretty good job. And I've worked with him for a while, done a lot of key stuff for him and module cloning, that sort of job that he's just not able to take care of. But I was like, all right, well, I'll come out there. We'll give it a shot. As no guarantees I'm going to be able to do this. Um, now, I know I'm going to have to provide a key for this thing because he doesn't have one. So, you know, we're kind of starting with an all keys lost. But here's the other part of it is, We've got a brand new BCM and we've got a brand new RF hub. Now, if all of those communicate and function correctly, which is an if, I'm starting to think as I go out there, I'm trying to think on a 2016 RAM, have I done something with both new key, well, with all new keys, new BCM and RF hub. Oh, and I should mention, I asked them. I asked him more than once. I'm like, is this new, new, or is this junkyard new? Is this used new? Because I don't know what it is. I, you know, we do a lot of module cloning, programming, whatever. And when shops call and they say, Hey, I've got a new blank. That doesn't always mean new. <laughs> I'd say a lot of the time it means that it's used. And so I will say on the phone, is it a new, new, 
And it's like, yeah, it's a new, new. And I get there and it's got junk hair writing. I'm like, you said it was new. Well, it is new to the vehicle. I'm like, no, no, no. And that's been a frustration of ours that um, my admin guy is fighting through now as he's answering the phones. But I was very clear with him. Like, these are brand new from the dealer. He's like, yes, brand new from the dealer, RF hub and BCM and keyless ignition node. And I'm going to be supplying the key for this thing. Okay, cool. We can at least give this a shot and see what happens. So I get to the vehicle. And again, I'm kind of thinking about like, where do I start with this? Do I program keys first? Do I program the BCM first? Do I program the RF hub first? Who's going to communicate? How is this going to work? And I hadn't been in a situation exactly like this before. Okay, well, where do I go? Um, this is kind of where I want to point out something really useful in service information that pertains to these Stellantis vehicles. So we'll, we'll just go with that. I usually say Chrysler. That's my default, but whatever. This is a Ram. In service information, and this has been true for a number of years. This goes way back into the early 2000s. I don't know when it started exactly, but for a lot of different Chrysler vehicles, if you are replacing multiple modules or you're replacing a module and keys at the same time, and there's a lot of different reasons and scenarios where you might be in that situation, it is important to at least take a little bit of time to consider which module you should do first and in what order you should program the new things in. Not only for successful programming, getting the vehicle working, but there's in a specific situation, a potential where you could create a scenario where now you've got to get another used module for one reason or another, right? And we want to avoid that. So within service information, this is um, something that I've used, utilized before, but sometimes, you know, there's just so much that we're trying to remember. I kind of forget this is there. If you go into whatever service information you're using, and I was using all data for this one, but you could do it in Identifix. I'm sure this obviously comes from the factory service information. It's probably in Mitchell too. If you go to the search bar of whatever service information you're using and you search replacement and programming order guide, it's going to come up with an extremely useful chart that is going to break down, hey, if you're replacing these components... Here's the order that you're going to program them in or set them up in. Here's the steps that you take based off of what you're replacing, okay? And this is set up on a chart. And so in the vertical column, it's going to show you the module, right? So for this particular 16 RAM, in the vertical column, on the left side of the chart, I have RF hub, BCM, FABX, which are the keys, and PCM. Okay, so four different components. I wouldn't say modules because the keys aren't modules, but four different components that you're replacing. And the horizontal chart across the top is a series of conditions numbered 1 through 15. Okay, there are 15 different conditions. Now, here are the conditions. If you go down the chart and you look over, it will say new or existing for each of those four components. Okay, so for instance here right our vertical column rf hub bcm fabix pcm condition one is we are putting a new rf hub in but the bcm the fabix and the pcm are existing meaning we're not changing them they're original the vehicle okay condition two our our rf hub is existing it's original to the vehicle but the bcm body control module is new the Fabix and the PCM are existing. Condition three, RF hub and BCM are existing. We're putting new keys in, but the PCM is existing as well. All right, and so on and so forth, right? Any combination of new component replacement that you can imagine. And I mean, this is useful too for just replacing keys or just replacing a PCM or just, okay, whatever you're replacing, you can look at this chart, but here's where this really becomes useful is if you're replacing multiple components at the same time. Okay. Now, if you go down the list from each condition, it is going to give you an order of what you need to do as far as steps for setup and programming, depending on what new components that you are putting in this vehicle. 
And this really changes. I mean, look this up and look through the chart. And depending on what new components you're putting in, in what combination, this completely changes the steps that you're going to take to program them to the vehicle, right? And so when I pulled this up, I'm like, oh, okay, sweet. This is what I do. I just follow these steps, okay? And I'm looking at this chart. And here's what I have on this vehicle, new RF up, new body control module, new keys, and an existing PCM, right? he didn't replace the PCM, and I guess that didn't get wet. I mean, it worked, so I'm assu- I, I didn't look at the, via- the, the module myself here, but the PCM was functional. But with those three new modules and a functioning PCM, I am in condition 14, so I've almost gotten to the end of the chart. And if I go down from condition 14 with those three new modules and an existing PCM, I have four steps that I am supposed to run. The first one, it says run restore vehicle configuration. And it should enable, this is in parentheses, it should enable PCM and RF hub. Okay, meaning that our restore vehicle configuration is somehow pulled from the data in the PCM, or it's using the data in the PCM to pull it from Chrysler server, however that works. The next step is to program the keys. The third step is once the keys are programmed, run the restore vehicle configuration again to write the full configuration. And then step four, in the RF hub, run the RF hub replace function. That's it. Those are my four steps to do if I'm replacing these three components, which is exactly what I was doing. Now, I followed this. I did it. Uh, There was one additional step. I had to remove the BCM from shipping mode, which is a function within the BCM, simple enough to do. And I'm using YTAC for this. And then the other thing that we ran into was after I ran the first run restore configuration, I tried programming keys in. I wasn't able to, and I found I wasn't able to communicate with the RF hub. Uh, The RF hub, you should be able to talk to even with the key off, and I wasn't able to. So, and this is kind of what I was expecting when I got into this. Like, I'd be surprised if all of this works. And he's like, well, hey, I got the RF hub exposed because you kind of told me that this might be the case. Can we check just see if we got everything to it? Because I can talk to my BCM. I can talk to my PCM. I cannot talk to the RF hub. Sure, let's grab a test light and see what we got. Now, we had power, ground, and comms, but we unplugged this thing, and you could tell, hey, the water's been in here. We've got corroded terminals. We pulled a little red, I guess you call it a holder for all the pins out. We cleaned out a bunch of green stuff, and the positive terminal was really spread out. So we took a pick. We pushed it together. This isn't permanent fix, but hey, it'll work for right now. Put this thing together and the RF hub powers up, starts talking. And actually we had the key on at this point. The wiper started running and everything. And so at this point I can continue with my process. So that was a little bit of a blockade that of course this chart can't foresee. But now we got the RF hub online. And I actually ran the restore configuration, which you have to do with YTech. I don't know of another tool that will do that because this is different than a proxy alignment. So aftermarket tools will do proxy alignments. This is a restore configuration, which pulls data from Chrysler's server or Stellantis' server to bring that vehicle back to the factory options based off of the VIN, right? So I run that, even though I already did it, I wasn't sure with the RF hub offline if that made a difference. So I did that. Then I was able to program a key. I could communicate with the RF hub, which stores the key data. I added in a new key. Cool. I did exactly what it said. I ran the restore configuration a third time. And then I went into the RF hub, ran the RF hub replace function. And that was it. I mean, now, granted, this truck didn't start. It sounded like it had no compression, but that's not my problem. <laughs> the, the keys were programmed. The remote worked. All of my modules that I was programming were communicating. And it actually did crank over the engine. And the rest was on him. And he was happy as a clam to be to that point on this thing because he said he only spent like three grand on this truck. And he's he's really hoping to get it together and sell it to some sucker. I, I don't know. But um, anyways, the, the rest of it is on him. I, luckily, I don't have to worry about that. But that worked. And now, would I have been able to get to that without this chart? Probably, maybe. Would have been a roundabout way of me just hitting buttons, seeing what happens. 
Yeah, definitely. That's how it would have been. And I've been there and I've done that. And I still do that from time to time. But man, this is a really helpful tool. And I wish every manufacturer had something like this. They don't. But, so sometimes you have to sort through it yourself. But if you're working on a Chrysler Solanus vehicle, check out this module replacement guide. Um, that's the name of the chart. Again, when I searched in service information, I just do replacement and programming order guide. Um, that's definitely the way that you can find it in all data. It's also under the programming and relearning chart. Um, but yeah, really, really helpful. So check that out and uh, hopefully that'll get you through. Um, one thing I should note is if you're doing use control modules, you can kind of throw some of this stuff out the window. Um, the chart is based on you putting a new control module in place of whatever it's listing, not necessarily use. Not to say it won't work, but the accuracy of the steps uh, might be different. Uh, you may have to, uh, I'd say in a lot of cases, especially newer stuff, you're going to have to do additional work in order to get this to happen. And let's say you're cloning a module, well, then you might not have to do some of these steps. So this is, of course, with new control module replacement, but um, I uh, found it extremely helpful for me today to use this on this particular vehicle. And even though I didn't hear it run, I was actually pretty impressed that we got to the point <laughs> where it was. Um, now, I, I would not recommend getting into flood vehicles, man. That's It is a disaster. I, I think I think you're better off going with the lightning strike myself. Uh, you could probably find all of the components easier uh, with a lightning strike as opposed to a flood vehicle. Again, depending on the water level, man, you're replacing it everything and if you don't whatever you don't replace you're gonna have issues with it later um so luckily i'm up here in minnesota and we don't get a ton of them but they do filter through on the auction uh, so here and there but we don't get too many floods up here in the midwest unless you live right on the river <laughs> that's about it but other than that just a lot of snow and rust to take out the vehicles and and yeah sometimes rust can be bad but not quite as bad as flood vehicles so that's what i wanted to share with you today uh again thank you everybody out there for listening to the show thank you for everybody i met get to hang out with at the accelerate event in florida really cool but with that all the way let's get out there start fixing the world one car at a time